Dowsing is a type of divination employed in attempts to locate groundwater, buried metals or ores, gemstones, oil, gravesites, and many other objects and materials without the use of scientific apparatus. Dowsing is considered a pseudoscience and there is no scientific evidence that it is any more effective than random chance, and dowsers often achieve good results because random chance has a high probability of finding water in favorable terrain. Dowsing is also known as divining, especially in reference to interpretation of results, doodlebugging, particularly in the United States, in searching for petroleum, or when searching specifically for water, water finding, water witching in the United States, or water dowsing. A Y-shaped twig or rod, or two L-shaped ones, individually called a dowsing rod, divining rod, Latin, virgula divina or baculus divinatorius, vining rod, or witching rod, are sometimes used during dowsing, although some dowsers use other equipment or no equipment at all. Dowsing appears to have arisen in the context of Renaissance magic in Germany and it remains popular among believers in Fortiana or Radiesthesia. The motion of dowsing rods is now generally attributed to the idiomotor response. The idiomotor phenomenon is a psychological phenomenon wherein a subject makes motions unconsciously. In less complex terms, dowsing rods only move due to accidental or involuntary movements of the person using it. Topic history Dowsing as practiced today may have originated in Germany during the 16th century, when it was used in attempts to find metals. As early as 1518 Martin Luther listed dowsing for metals as an act that broke the first commandment i.e., as occultism. The 1550 edition of Sebastian Munster's Cosmographia contains a woodcut of a dowser with forked rod in hand walking over a cutaway image of a mining operation. The rod is labeled Virgula Divina, Gluckrut, Latin, Divine Rod, German, Wunschelroot, Fortune Rod or Stick, but there is no text accompanying the woodcut. By 1556 Georgius Agricola's treatment of mining and smelting of ore, De Re Metallica, included a detailed description of dowsing for metal ore. There are many great contentions between miners concerning the forked twig, for some say that it is of the greatest use in discovering veins, and others deny it. All alike grasp the forks of the twig with their hands, clenching their fists, it being necessary that the clenched fingers should be held toward the sky in order that the twig should be raised at that end where the two branches meet. Then they wander hither and thither at random through mountainous regions. It is said that the moment they place their feet on a vein the twig immediately turns and twists, and so by its action discloses the vein, when they move their feet again and go away from that spot the twig becomes once more immobile. In the 16th century, German deep mining technology was in enormous demand all over Europe. German miners were licensed to live and work in Elizabethan England, particularly in the stanneries of Devon and Cornwall and in Cumbria. In other parts of England, the technique was used in Elizabeth's royal mines for calamine. By 1638 German miners were recorded using the technique in silver mines in Wales. The middle low German name for a forked stick, y rod, was schlag rod, striking rod. This was translated in the 16th century Cornish dialect to duschen, duschen according to Middle English to strike or fall. In 1691 the philosopher John Locke, who was born in the West Country, used the term deusing rod for the old Latin name virgula divina, so, douse is synonymous with strike, hence the phrases, to douse, strike a light, to douse, strike a sail. In the lead mining area of the Mendip Hills in Somerset in the 17th century the natural philosopher Robert Boyle, inspired by the writings of Agricola, watched a practitioner try to find latent veins of metals. Boyle saw the hazel divining rod Virgula divinatoria stoop in the hands of the diviner, who protested that he was not applying any force to the twig. Boyle accepted the man's genuine belief but himself remained unconvinced. Although dowsing in search of water is considered an ancient practice by some, old texts about searching for water do not mention using the divining rod, and the first account of this practice was in 1568. Sir William F. Barrett wrote in his 1911 book Psychical Research that, in a recent 
admirable life of Saint Teresa of Spain, the following incident is narrated. Teresa in 1568 was offered the site for a convent to which there was only one objection there was no water supply. Happily, a friar Antonio came up with a twig in his hand, stopped at a certain spot, and appeared to be making the sign of the cross. But Teresa says, Really, I cannot be sure if it were the sign he made, at any rate, he made some movement with the twig and then he said, Dig just here, they dug, and lo, a plentiful fount of water gushed forth, excellent for drinking, copious for washing, and it never ran dry. Quote, As the writer of this life remarks, Teresa, not having heard of dowsing, has no explanation for this event, and regarded it as a miracle. This, I believe, is the first historical reference to dowsing for water. In 1662, dowsing was declared to be superstitious, or rather satanic, by a Jesuit, Gaspar Schott, though he later noted that he wasn't sure that the devil was always responsible for the movement of the rod. In the south of France in the 17th century it was used in tracking criminals and heretics. Its abuse led to a decree of the Inquisition in 1701, forbidding its employment for purposes of justice. An epigram by Samuel Shepard, from Epigrams Theological, Philosophical, and Romantic, 1651, runs thus: Virgula Divina. Some sorcerers do boast they have a rod, gathered with vows and sacrifice, and born about will strangely nod to hidden treasure where it lies. Mankind is sure that rod divine. For to the wealthiest ever they incline. Early attempts at an explanation of dowsing were based on the notion that the divining rod was physically affected by emanations from substances of interest. The following explanation is from William Price's 1778 Mineralogia Cornubiensis. The corpuscles that rise from the minerals, entering the rod, determine it to bow down, in order to render it parallel to the vertical lines which the effluvia describe in their rise. In effect the mineral particles seem to be emitted from the earth, now the virgula rod, being of a light porous wood, gives an easy passage to these particles, which are also very fine and subtle, the effluvia then driven forwards by those that follow them, and pressed at the same time by the atmosphere incumbent on them, are forced to enter the little interstices between the fibers of the wood, and by that effort they oblige it to incline, or dip down perpendicularly, to become parallel with the little columns which those vapors form in their rise. A study towards the end of the 19th century concluded that the phenomenon was attributed to cryptisthesia, whereby the practitioner made unconscious observations of the terrain and involuntarily influenced the movement of the rod. Dowsing was conducted in South Dakota in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to help homesteaders, farmers, and ranchers locate water wells on their property. In the late 1960s during the Vietnam War, some United States Marines used dowsing to attempt to locate weapons and tunnels. As late as in 1986, when 31 soldiers were taken by an avalanche during an operation in the NATO drill Anchor Express in Vastalen, Norway, the Norwegian army attempted to locate soldiers buried in the avalanche using dowsing as a search method. Dowsing is still used by some farmers and by water engineers in the UK. <laughs> Topic: Equipment. Topic. Why rods? Traditionally, the most common dowsing rod is a forked Y-shaped branch from a tree or bush. Some dowsers prefer branches from particular trees, and some prefer the branches to be freshly cut. Hazel twigs in Europe and witch hazel in the United States are traditionally commonly chosen, as are branches from willow or peach trees. The two ends on the forked side are held one in each hand with the third the stem of the Y pointing straight ahead. Often the branches are grasped palms down. The dowser then walks slowly over the places where he suspects the target for example, minerals or water may be, and the dowsing rod is expected to dip, incline or twitch when a discovery is made. This method is sometimes known as willow witching. L rods Many dowsers today use a pair of simple L shaped metal rods. 
One rod is held in each hand, with the short arm of the L held upright, and the long arm pointing forward. When something is found, the rods cross over one another. If the object is long and straight, such as a water pipe, the rods may point in opposite directions, showing its orientation. The rods may be fashioned from wire coat hangers or wire flags used for locating utilities. Glass or plastic rods have also been accepted. Straight rods are also sometimes used for the same purposes, and were not uncommon in early 19th century New England. Topic. Police and military devices A number of devices have been marketed for modern police and military use, for example ADI 651, SNIFX, and the GT200. A U.S. government study advised against buying bogus explosive detection equipment and noted that all testing has shown the devices to perform no better than random chance devices. Sandia National Laboratories tested the mole programmable system manufactured by Global Technical Limited of Kent, UK and found it ineffective. The ADI 651 is a device produced by ATSC UK and widely used by Iraqi police to detect explosives. Many have denied its effectiveness and contended that the ADI 651 failed to prevent many bombings in Iraq. On 23 April 2013, the director of ATSC, James McCormick was convicted of fraud by misrepresentation and later sentenced to 10 years in prison. Earlier, the British government had announced a ban on the export of the ADI 651. SNIFX was the subject of a report by the United States Navy Explosive Ordnance Disposal that concluded, The handheld SNIFX explosives detector does not work. Global Technical GT200 is a dowsing-type explosive detector which contains no scientific mechanism. <inaudible> <inaudible> studies Dowsing studies from the early 20th century were examined by geologist John Walter Gregory in a report for the Smithsonian Institution. Gregory concluded that the results were a matter of chance or explained by observations from ground surface clues. Geologist W. A. McFadgian tested three dowsers during 1943-1944 in Algeria. The results were entirely negative. A 1948 study in New Zealand by P. A. Ongley tested 75 dowsers' ability to detect water. None of them was more reliable than chance. According to Ongley, not one showed the slightest accuracy. Archaeometrist Martin Aitken tested British dowser P. A. Rain in 1959. Rain failed to douse the location of a buried kiln that had been identified by a magnetometer. In 1971, dowsing experiments were organized by British engineer R. A. Folks on behalf of the Ministry of Defence. The results were no more reliable than a series of guesses. Physicists John Taylor and Eduardo Balanovsky reported in 1978 a series of experiments they conducted that searched for unusual electromagnetic fields emitted by dowsing subjects, they did not detect any. A 1979 review by Evan Z. Vogt and Ray Hyman examined many controlled studies of dowsing for water, and found that none of them showed better than chance results. Three British academics Richard N. Bailey, Eric Cambridge and H. Dennis Briggs carried out dowsing experiments at the grounds of various churches. They reported successful results in their book Dowsing and Church Archaeology 1988. Their experiments were critically examined by archaeologist Martin Van Leusen who suggested they were badly designed and the authors had redefined the test parameters on what was classified as a hit or miss to obtain positive results. A 2006 study of grave dowsing in Iowa reviewed 14 published studies and determined that none of them correctly predicted the location of human burials, and simple scientific experiments demonstrated that the fundamental principles commonly used to explain grave dowsing were incorrect. A randomized double-blind trial in 2012 was carried out to determine whether homeopaths were able to distinguish between bryonia and placebo by use of a dowsing method. 
The results were negative. Topic: <laughs> Castle 1991 study. A 1990 double-blind study was undertaken in Kassel, Germany, under the direction of the Gesellschaft zur Wissenschaftlichen Untersuchung von Parawissenschaften Society for the Scientific Investigation of the Parasciences. James Randi offered a US$10,000 prize to any successful dowser. The three-day test of some 30 dowsers involved plastic pipes through which water flow could be controlled and directed. The pipes were buried 50 cm under a level field, the position of each marked on the surface with a colored strip. The dowsers had to tell whether water was running through each pipe. All the dowsers signed a statement agreeing this was a fair test of their abilities and that they expected a 100% success rate. However, the results were no better than chance, thus no one was awarded the prize. Topic. Betts 1990 study In a 1987–88 study in Munich by Hans-Dieter Betts and other scientists, 500 dowsers were initially tested for their skill, and the experimenters selected the best 43 among them for further tests. Water was pumped through a pipe on the ground floor of a two-story barn. Before each test, the pipe was moved in a direction perpendicular to the water flow. On the upper floor, each dowser was asked to determine the position of the pipe. Over two years, the dowsers performed 843 such tests and, of the 43 pre-selected and extensively tested candidates, at least 37 showed no dowsing ability. The results from the remaining six were said to be better than chance, resulting in the experimenter's conclusion that some dowsers in particular tasks, showed an extraordinarily high rate of success, which can scarcely if at all be explained as due to chance. A real core of dowser phenomena can be regarded as empirically proven." Five years after the Munich study was published, Jim T. Enright, a professor of physiology who emphasized correct data analysis procedure, contended that the study's results are merely consistent with statistical fluctuations and not significant. He believed the experiments provided the most convincing disproof imaginable that dowsers can do what they claim, stating that the data analysis was special, unconventional and customized, replacing it with more ordinary analyses. He noted that the best dowser was on average 4 mm out of 10 m closer to a mid-line guess, an advantage of 0.04%, and that the five other good dowsers were on average farther than a mid-line guess. Enright emphasized that the experimenters should have decided beforehand how to statistically analyze the results. If they only afterward chose the statistical analysis that showed the greatest success, then their conclusions would not be valid until replicated by another test analyzed by the same method. He further pointed out that the six good dowsers did not perform any better than chance in separate tests. Another study published in Pathophysiology hypothesized that such experiments as this one that were carried out in the 20th century could have been interfered with by man-made radio frequency radiation, as test subjects' bodies absorbed the radio waves and unconscious hand movement reactions took place following the standing waves or intensity variations. Topic: Scientific reception. Dowsing is considered to be a pseudoscience. Science writers such as William Benjamin Carpenter (1877), Mille Culpin (1920), and Martin Gardner (1957) considered the movement of dowsing rods to be the result of unconscious muscular action. This view is widely accepted amongst the scientific community and also by some in the dowsing community. The dowsing apparatus is known to amplify slight movements of the hands caused by a phenomenon known as the idiomotor response. People's subconscious minds may influence their bodies without consciously deciding to take action. This would make the dowsing rod susceptible to the dowsers as subconscious knowledge or perception, but also to confirmation bias. Psychologist David Marks in a 1986 article in Nature included dowsing in a list of 
Effects which until recently were claimed to be paranormal but which can now be explained from within orthodox science. Specifically, dowsing could be explained in terms of sensory cues, expectancy effects, and probability. Science writer Peter Daimplay has noted that when dowsing is subjected to scientific testing, it fails. Daimplay has written that although some dowsers claim success, this can be attributed to the underground water table being distributed relatively uniformly in certain areas. In regard to dowsing and its use in archaeology, Kenneth Fader has written that. The vast majority of archaeologists don't use dowsing, because they don't believe it works. Psychologist Chris French has noted that dowsing does not work when it is tested under properly controlled conditions that rule out the use of other cues to indicate target location. <laughs> Notable dowsers Notable dowsers include a report in The Guardian on the subject of British Water Company employees using dowsing, including from Anglian and Seven Trent, noted that, "...the disclosure has prompted calls for the regulator to stop companies passing the cost of a discredited medieval practice on to their customers." Offwatt said any firm failing to meet its commitments to customers faced a financial penalty. Anglian Water also attested to the effectiveness of dowsing rods. A similar report from the BBC noted all the companies emphasized they do not encourage the use of divining rods nor issue them to engineers, and said modern methods such as drones and listening devices were preferred. In fiction Fictional dowsers include equals equals see also